Jess, we can hear you. Okay, so um, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I will I will talk about three uh, three elements. Um, one is how to import your images, um, to, so you can start to work on them. Um, how you annotate and the use of the uh, uh, artificial intelligence and how to use the standardized export or how to get the standardized export out of a good deal. And then Patrick will um, tell a little bit more about the distance calculations and the calibration. Um, I decided not to use Aguti online because I'm not always sure that the internet will be strong enough to do, um, keep on running. So if you are in the project, like Tancredi just explained, um, to start by importing the images, there is this button, which is called import. Uh, and when you click on the button, you will get to this screen. Um, and the first step you take is that you um, click on a new deployment. Um, once you clicked on the new deployment, Aguti will come and ask you to um, select files. You can drop and drag them, or you can just um, go onto your computer um, to a certain directory and simply by selecting all the images which you would like to select and then say load them, um, you will return to this slide which shows you that he's uploading. Um, it's written there, uploading 104 files. Um, he has successfully already uploaded 12 files and there are zero duplicates. Uh, what's the meaning of the duplicates? This is because sometimes when you select files, surely if you have like 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 images and you select them um, 1,500 the first time and 1,510 the second time, it could be that there is some overlap. Um, so Aguti checks them um, to be sure that there are no duplicates. This is also, however, this is also something to take care of because Aguti considers duplicate each file with the same name. So if you open and close your camera, he restarts, or most of them restart at image 0001. So you will regard them as duplicates. So watch out. Um, once all the image once all the images are uploaded, you can click this close button and then you will return to the screen, to this screen, and you have the possibility or to upload a new deployment or to click on create sequences because Aguti will create a sequence which is all the images together um, until there's a, a delay or a gap of 120 seconds without images, which means that he's taking, he's make, the camera is making pictures like a burst of 10. There is no delay, so he immediately restarts taking 10 more. Um, and this will continue till the moment there's no images. And if there are no images or there is a time lapse of two minutes, he will create a new sequence. So once you've clicked on the button, create sequences, uh, you will enter to this screen which is um, he wants to make new sequences for this deployment. The first thing which you will have to do is to select the sampling point. Uh, there are two possibilities. Uh, one is you add a new sampling point manually. Um, if you do this, you will get to this page where you can fill in the name of the sequence point over there, um, maybe a specific feature, and then you can zoom in or you can add the coordinates um, to create this new sampling point. The other possibility, which we normally use in this kind of bigger projects, is that you use the drop down and you select the, um, the sampling points which you previously uploaded yourself um, into a step by using a standardized um, file, which then brings automatically all the sampling points that are possible. And so you get a very neat and beautiful uh, list. I will go back for a moment to this one. If you are making the sequences, this start and end date, they will be empty. They will be gray and you will not be able to change anything. This is because 
he will, in the process of looking at sequences, he will go and look for the first image and the last image to decide it so itself. So don't try to change anything over there. Another very important issue when he's making the sequences and creating the deployment is the UTSA offset. Um, this is the time for which the cameras were set. Um, you can change this for each deployment because it's it's part of the project settings. So our project settings always say that we always use summer and winter time. We use an UTC offset of plus one. Um, so we in reality we stick to winter time. Um, imagine a camera it would be wrong um, and put on summertime. It's still possible for a specific deployment to change it over there. Otherwise, you don't touch it. So once he has created the sequences. He returns to the page and asks you or to annotate this deployment um, or to add a new deployment is again a possibility. So now all the images are there and there are sequences. So we would like to start annotating the images. Um, to get to the annotation screen, we go by annotate, which is quite logically. Um, and then you enter in this page, which shows you all the unannotated deployments. Um, as you can see over here, some are already a little bit in progress, 12%, other, one, other ones have no progress at all made until now. Um, and now there are two possibilities. Um, so I select the sampling point and I can start by annotating using artificial intelligence. Um, if I click this button, remember that in the project settings, so in there is a project settings. You have to have selected which annotation model will be used. Um, at the moment, there are two versions for the Western European species. So it's called the Western European species model version two. Uh, it's the, the best version for um, Europe, so to say. Uh, if you selected this Western European species, if it's empty, you cannot use AI. AI. Um, so then if I clicked on annotate by AI, you will see AI is scheduled. So you will be running and you will do AI on all the images, all the sequences, I have to say, um, that are in this, um, in this deployment. Uh, it's running, oh, the other possibility, I'm missing something, no. The other possibility is to annotate by hand. Um, if I click on annotation by hand, just I enter to this screen, which shows me an image. And over here on the bottom, I can go forwards or backwards to see all the images of the sequence. I annotate the whole sequence, so not image by image. So it's like going through a video, having a look, and then deciding, okay, I want to add an observation, which is this button. Um, and I will decide on a species. Um, I will decide the amount, sex and age. If I don't know them, I can select unknown. Like Tankeli said, there is a set of possible behaviors. It's species specific. So within the um, observatory, I think it would be good that we all agree on the same kind of um, behaviors. And once I have selected the species, the number, the sex, and the age class, I can save this observation. And the result will be like this. Um, there is a human being standing over here, which means that afterwards in the export, I will know that this sequence was annotated by a human being and not by the computer. There is a wild boar scene. Um, it's the sex is unknown, the age is unknown, and the quantity is one. Imagine that in the same sequence, um, four more piglets show up at the end of the sequence. I can add a second observation, which is again a wild boar with the quantities four. Uh, the sex is unknown, but the age is juvenile. So this allows you to differentiate within the same sequence uh, in two observations or the observation of two different kinds of animals of the same species or even though it's more rare, we can have two different species in a same sequence. Like we have sometimes 
uh, Fox and Deer, Batchers and Deer um, at the same uh, station appearing. The other buttons over here allow me to say that it's completely blank. So there's nothing to see. That it's a pickup and a setup, which means I see the people who are going to set up a camera or I see people who return after who pick up the camera. Um, this is a possibility for the deployment calibration, which will be explained by Patrick in the next talk. And maybe it's unknown. Um, with the unknown, please be careful. Surely, if you work with several people on a project, it's not because you don't know it that you have to click unknown. Um, leave it open because there is this button next and annotated so your colleagues can go to the unannotated ones and have a look. Once you clicked unknown, you will no longer be in this list. So just leave them open. If you have been using artificial intelligence, you would like to check if it was right. Um, so there is a filter which is located under browse. Um, and you can go to observations. So you don't browse the deployments, but you browse the observations. And then you get into this filter, which you can see over here. Uh, if I want to check, because in my project, I can have both AI uh, who decided, so the model as well as a human being. Um, so the first thing I do, I use the filter to select those who were annotated by the model. Uh, the second thing I do is I select the species I would like to check. So um, I, I check the model, I, then I selected the wild boar species. And now I can go to, an action, to the action. And the action is that I will check it. So by clicking on this um, uh, small pencil over there, I return to I get into this screen. Contrary to a human being, now there is this um, microchip standing there, indicated that it was the computer who made the annotation, who decided that there is one wild boar in this sequence of an unknown X sex and an unknown age. Um, and I've, I want to check this, or maybe if it's wrong, then I can click just in front of this will be uh, the sign. If I click over there, not on the button, but just before, um, allows me to edit. So then I go into this screen where I can say, it's a wild boar amount is uh, three. So I corrected it, sex and age are still unknown. And subsequently I can save the observation again, uh, which is done a corrected observation. Um, which as a result has that I had Syscrofa, I had Western European species, but now it's modified by me. So it's indicated modified by Jim Gazar. Um, at the moment, we're developing the possibility to have a checkbox over there saying this one is controlled. But as long as we don't have the checkbox, uh, the easy thing is you go to this um, wild ball, you simply click very quickly on editing, and then confirm and automatically your name will pop up over there so you will know which ones you checked and which were not yet checked. So this allows you if you use the artificial intelligence to go in um, to check for the species that are relevant um, and um, to check for the blanks if they're blank and it's also very important because if we correct them this information is then used again by the computer um, and by the artificial intelligence to correct the artificial uh, intelligence, to improve the quality of the results. So this I've said. This will be discussed by Patrick later on. So part of the annotation, like I said, one of the buttons over here is the deployment calibration, um, which is needed for the random encounter model. Um, so it will be the, the next talk. So now I have annotated all the sequences, or I ask the computer to annotate all the sequences. Um, and I want to um, export, of course, this information because I need this exported information to start working um, and calculating and doing analysis. Getting back to the project, um, I had before the first button was how to import my images, how to annotate the images, how to browse if, this, if you have the rights to do so. So now the next step is I want to export, which is completely at the bottom. Again, it's not possible for all the roles in your project. Everybody who is BI will be able to export this information or the data he collected. 
Um, so clicking on the export, you will enter this screen, export data, and you can use this button over there, create the export. And using the create the export, you will create a new export, um, which you then subsequently, by clicking on download, you will um, download the export you just created. It can take some time, so don't click several times on the create export button, but just give him the time um, to create the export. The export which you will download then at that moment will be a zip file. There you see it, zip. Um, and within this zip file, you will see four um, different files. One is the data package JSON, which is in having all the information on your project. There is one which has all the information on the deployments, all the information on the observations. So watch out, as I just said before, um, I can have two observations in the same sequence. So in this observation file, um, the sequence number can appear two times. And then there is the media file, which has for each of the observations, all the medias, so all the pictures, or the links to all the pictures um, that are concluded in this observation file. So you can unzip, one of the possibilities is to unzip this file and then open each of them. Um, and I will, I will, then you get, uh, then you get this, a very, classical but very nasty Excel file. Um, and I say nasty not, not because the file is nasty, but because Excel is nasty, uh, because Excel will, of course, ruin um, using points and other things, many of the data formats. The zip file which was created is fully built up as a standardized export. It's the same standardization was done at the moment for Iguti, for Trapper, for eMemo, for Wildlife Insights. Um, and this work is hosted at the moment um, by Biodiversity Information Standards, or TEDWIC, so like some people call it. Um, and all the information can be found there, which makes now that there is a quite a high inter interoperability between the different um, systems. So the whole explanation can be found on this file, on this um, page, what I just explained. Um, so one possibility is to make an export and use the CSV files um, and then import the CSV files into your computer and start playing with, with them in R to um, connect them, to make links between the, the observations and the deployments, the observations and the um, zip files and the, the media files. Um, but it's quite a long way and it's quite um, time consuming. So in the meantime, we created a, an R package, which is called Camtraptor. And the only thing you have to tell to Camtraptor is where are my, where is the zip file or where is the um, unpacked zip file. And Camtraptor will be able, so it's simply install the package. It's a classical R um, package with, with this page having all the information on possible um, tools which you can use. And one of the easiest or one of the most important tools or commands is the read chemtrap DP. So what is happening at the moment is that you have an export format, which is chemtrap DP, which is creating this zip file. And then you have a, a second package, which is chemtraptor, which can use read chemtrap DP. And he will read automatically your file containing the zip file, uh, containing the media file, observation file, deployment file, and JSON. If you use this in uh, read chemtrap DP from this package um, in R, so it's there, I told them um, to read chemtrap DP, the files of one of our projects, which is called GME8, and to put them all together um, in a new list. So he creates this list, uh, and it's a list containing 15 elements. Uh, because the JSON is um, unpacked again by this read command, giving you all the information like who did it, where, where was the place, who were the contributors. Um, and it also contains the data 
as being deployments, media, and observations. Many of the other commands can then very easily be used, for example, to, to do this. There is a command called um, map, deploy, map depth relative abundance index, which then gives you all the relative abundance indexes for all camera plots, which you have been using, um, which are available in the package. So each dot is a location and a deployment. Uh, this to say that if you use the standardized zip export, um, there's a lot of functionalities which you don't have to develop yourself anymore to visualize and analyze the data you've just put, um, you just annotated using, uh, using Agduti. To end up, um, and then we can have time for questions. Um, this is, of course, not work done only by the people on the bottom, being Wageningen and ZSL and our institute, funded by, partly by LifeWatch. But it's um, work which has been used and grown, and we got a lot of input of all the different projects uh, and all the different collaborators that have been using Eguti and first and second steps of what we are developing picture on this screen. Um, and secondly, there is a at eguti.eu docs, a lot of what I've been talking about can be found. It's still in full development. This um, information on Eguti page. Um, it's a it's a GitHub repo, so it's still growing, but a lot of the information can be found over there. And then I think there is now time for questions, and I will start also a goodie. So if people have questions, we can also go into the project um, rather than using the slides. But by making these slides, um, it's more easy to share what I've been telling right now than if I had to show it in a goodie. So that's it for now. Um, and I think, Joaquim, we still have plenty of time for some questions. So, floor is open. Thank you, Jing. Yes, we have plenty of time for for questions. Just to let you know that uh, uh, we are going to summarize the instructions you can find in this uh, user guide in Aguti website. We are going to to put all of them in a single document, and this will be available in uh, the observatory website in order to to facilitate to you the uh, your work um, uh, to find answer to to your questions. Uh, yes, you can raise your your hand if you have any question at this stage. Uh, please, uh, uh, Raham Smith. Jim, I was wondering with your AI classification, does it return a, a probability of being right kind of thing um, yeah. so that you could check those for which it is less certain first? Um, it is, but it's not in the... Wait, I should check if it's included in the filter. Um, mm, 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 observations. Just a thought, if we're looking through a few thousand images yeah. for a large deployment. Uh, at the moment, it's not in the filter, but but I think it's a, it's a good suggestion to um, to ask in the filter. There's several, the, several buttons and clicks which would be nice to have in the filter. Uh, one is that you are able to check or to select for those who were not yet checked before by yourself, which, as I showed, is now a, a way around. And the other one would indeed be to... Um, to have a kind of cert certainty or something like this too. Now there is there is a um, there is a, a, a cutoff. Um, if Patrick is there, he can maybe answer also. There is a cutoff, and if he's not sure enough, then he's not returning a classification. Uh, so then it's a you will not. So if I, if I go, well, I go to Aguti for a certain moment. Um, annotate. I have to find an example. Not in this project. <laughs> Yes, give me a second. At any rate, you have to be very careful using the AI. Don't use version one, use version two, and just try it on a single deployment first to see whether it works for your, your region. Uh, so it might be that your region includes species for which we didn't train the model yet because the model was made for Northwestern Europe. The one for Europe as a whole is still being developed. Actually, it's going to be developed by you because you submit the photos that we can use to train the model. And then second, there's a known issue 
because the AI works on individual photos, it may recognize different species uh, on different photos of the same animal within a sequence, and then uh, it returns multiple species in some instances. So version one is really terrible in that. Uh, so this is why I recommend just forgetting about version one. Version two should be better. And version <laughs> three should have an improved uh, improved uh, decision model to return to you the right species. So these are two known issues. Um, if you so be careful not to not to uh, apply uh, the AI to the entire your, all your photos at once. Just try it before you choose it. Okay, okay. Uh, so Pat Patrick, that shouldn't be much of a problem with wild boar, but it might no, be the other species. It's ninety five. Um, it's 95% sure, and I just um, checked my uh, show. I think you see my screen again? Yeah. Yeah. So this is from one of the projects um, we're running, Mika. It's a very nasty project because we're looking at beavers, muskrats, and other animals swimming in the water. So it's very difficult. Um, and as you can see, if you run the AI, sometimes they only decided to give a return on 41, 72, 70. Um, or, or more, so he's not determining everything. So we still have to look at some of the sequences which he's not able to do. Um, so then you know already. Like I have to go back to the annotate and see what's what's still okay. Over there. So so just one final thought for me then, Jim and Patrick. If if we wanted to go back and look at this data for let's say rabbits or hares, mm -hmm. it may be less good. We may have to rerun an updated AI because hares in Southeast Europe might turn into rabbits where they don't exist or it won't recognize the right, right ones in Italy and things like that. So I guess if we're going back to look at other species, we may want to consider what the AI is being trained for, but it should be fine for all the wild boar analysis we're doing just now. We have been using it now for yeah. wild boar and deer and roe deer and deer, and we have no we have hardly any problems. Um, you reach the level that we wonder, surely on large scale projects, if wasting two weeks checking the eye to find the two animals that were wrong, um, we will do. The only problem is the other way around, like Patrick just said. He's looking at specific images and sometimes um, in one sequence, like small piglets in the dark, he, did, he says that he doesn't know what they are. So he then makes a guess. And if I check, the filter by wild boar, he will return it correctly, like in this sequence of wild boar. But if I would check it from the other way around, and I would say I'm looking for all um, Odensia or all foxes, maybe there are some wild boar in there, in the dark, in the background, piglets running around or something like this. Um, so, but in general, it was working for the wild boar, like it's working quite well. We have no. Okay, brilliant. Thanks. There is another question. I don't know from who. Um, yes, there's also a question in the chat. There is me, Jim. Yes. Yeah, Paolo. Go Thank ahead. you, Jim. Uh, congratulations for the talks. So if at some point uh, I'm interested in download, let's say, the photos or the picture only for one species, uh, it is possible to download the original photos, not the Excel file, for only one species. For instance, or two species, I mean, not all of them in any case. Yeah, well, well you can do the, the easiest thing then is to go to the export and um, use the package where, which is then filtering, and then you ask them the media files. That will be the straight, most straightforward way because he's having the link of all the images um, in the media files. Um, so don't, 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 do not download it from Aguti, but make the export and then read the images um, in an R package. But not one by one, I guess. No, 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 not one by one. I mean, we, we made an export. I mean, before this filter was, was there, which I just showed, we made like a very small R program and said, I want to see from this Mika project all the beaver images. And he downloaded yeah. all the beaver images. And um, we made a kind of a, a filter tool, which I can send you, where you can say, I want to see all the images of these or this species in my project. And then you so, return some. Okay. So this function is already included, right, in the package that you 
it's so not thought, included in the package, but it's written as a as a independent function. But we can write. I can send it to you. It's no problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Um, thank, question in the chat. I, I don't yes. find the chat. Where is the chat? There is a question by by Luca Dunis from Slovenia. Uh, should we import empty pictures, for example, camera activated by Win? The, the answer is don't don't throw away anything. Import everything into Aguti, and Aguti will and, and otherwise you're missing images um, and we're missing times. So just import the whole SD card and then run the annotation. <laughs> because if you start throwing away, then the risk is very big. Certainly, some people throw away in the beginning. Or at the end, because there are many pictures of the people running around, <laughs> and then you're missing the start date and the end date and all this kind of. So um, surely, if you work with volunteers in the field, don't make life difficult and upload the SD card. Um, There's one nice. exception, though. Suppose, for example, that your your camera falls off the tree or something happens to the setup, then there's no point in the, in in selecting the photos from that point onward. So that will be the end point of your deployment, and everything after that point um, will be will you well basically is not valid. It your camera didn't function, so don't don't upload that part that with the the camera no longer functions. So for example, think of uh, um, well once for example I had that a spider would uh, cover the lens and you wouldn't see anything anymore. Uh, and that would be a point where I would say, OK, this is the end of the deployment. It, it's no longer functioning. Another example is that the tree on which the camera was uh, mounted fell, fell over with the camera. From that point onward, I couldn't see anything, so that ends my deployment. And then uh, just like somebody would would uh, just like if the batteries would run out, that also automatically ends your deployment. But then you don't have any photos, so that's easy. OK. More questions? There's two more questions in the chat, Jim. Yeah, I'm looking for the chat. And for some reason, I cannot see it. I can read it. Valérie yeah. asks, is it possible to filter, for example, between dates before exporting? Mm, you, I wouldn't know why I should do it. Um, but Valérie, where are you? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, Jim, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, my, my question is, is due because sometimes there is really big, big, big file, take time for the export and just wondering if that would decrease the time to export data and it will it will surely take you more time to make a selection than export it and write it i mean the the cam traptop has a function which is called predicate and it's the first sentence and predicate allows you to filter on species on time steps on locations on whatever you can imagine so the time the computer needs to make the export i mean we have now the the project in, in Meerdal, which is seven years of and plenty. Of, it takes some time, but but using the R functionalities, I would never, I would always go to R, which allows you to do whatever selection you would like to do. So at the moment, it's not possible. Um, but I, I'm afraid that the time you would win would be very small. But you can, yeah. of course, uh, use the browse observations. Uh, page to to define a time range, and there you can see all the observations from that interval. If you yeah, but just you cannot, wanna, it, but you can't you cannot download those. The export. You cannot no. you cannot use it to filter the export. Exactly. The export always filters the whole package, um, or the whole project. Then uh, Guillermo Pereira has a question: How about non-functioning cameras that causes lack of data, like an SD card error? There is nothing, so it's a it's a non-functioning camera. So the 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 package will tell you that for a certain moment the deployment stopped because the SD card is stopped. It's like Patrick just said, if the battery runs out and you upload it, then you will have a deployment that like our deployments are one month. If after two weeks the battery runs out, you will have one deployment which is only one week. Um, 
there is at the moment a, a functioning cam chapter which gives you for all the camera traps or for all the deployments the the time start and end so in this scheme you will see that you have a deployment which is not um, as long as it should be what we do is that we have a, a, a manually written function which selects only deployments with a minimum of 22 days all the others are thrown out uh, for further analysis in um, occupancy modeling or whatever in order to avoid um, this kind of well very short... and in the case of Guillermo's example uh, lack of uh, an SD card error then you don't have anything to upload because it's just okay. empty then no. of course you don't upload anything you didn't you didn't basically you don't have a deployment at that point but uh, okay. other other things that that if the deployment is partially valid, you upload that part. If it's invalid, you don't upload it. You have to redo it. It's just not, you didn't sample, so it doesn't belong in the data set. Okay, there's another question by uh, Jordi. Um, he says, we have done two types of calibration, stick and pegs at distance. The images with pegs have been taken with mobile phone. Uh, all these images have to be uploaded. That I leave to you, Patrick, afterwards, because I never worked with the sticks in the field. I only worked with the sticks in the new protocol and not the old one. So that uh, that's a kind of answer. Uh, I'm I don't understand why you would take uh, photos with the mobile phone because it's it serves to calibrate the the, the camera trap, not the mobile phone. So. Um, I don't understand this, but perhaps. Uh, Sorry, Patrick, uh, thank you. Um, and I think the mobile phone picture have been requested by by us in the protocol, but I think they are to uh, have a better view of the references so that you can then understand in the picture taken from the camera which with, because sometimes maybe the rock can be partially covered by something else in front so with the picture taken with a phone from a higher point you have a better view and then you can understand in the picture taken from the camera which is clearly lower on the ground what is what ah okay so it's basically um, something ads. additional, but we don't upload that to Aguti because it's yeah. not something that you analyze. You just keep it separate to uh, clarify your setup, right? Okay, yeah, then yeah. I get it. Yeah. yeah, this is for the former protocol for manual identification of distances. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, any question? Yes. Here's one more. Can you see it, yes. Jim? Joanna asks, hi, there is a recommended number of pictures to be uploaded at the time, uh, question mark. For example, if I have a deployment with 5,000 pictures, can I uplo upload them all together or would it be better to upload them in parts to avoid errors like you, we got in Wildlife Insights? If you would, if you had asked the question two years ago, I would have told you to take thousand by thousand, um, but at the moment I can say just take 5,000 and wait and it will do it <laughs> um, yeah it works yeah i can work. confirm it, it works it, even it, it, with uh, ten thousand photos yeah it, it works without any problem um the, the issue is if you take thousand by thousand um then you will have to check for the duplicates if you didn't take the number thousand one twice and this kind of stuff so just take the whole bunch and um the only thing which you should not do at the moment um is open aguti on four different screens and start uploading four different deployments at the same time. Um, that makes us sometimes a mess because you're communicating from your computer to Aguti four different times at the same time. But uh, there's no reason for selecting just part of the of the SD card, so it works. All right, clear to you, uh, Joanna. And then Daniel has a question. He asks. In the browse window where you can correct the AI annotated pictures, can you also filter for pictures or sequences annotated as empty? Question mark. Yes. Yes. 
The species, the species is simply no species. So there, and or you can even wait. I will show you the um, the browse again. So I don't. No results. There are no blanks, so that's easy. Um, oh, no, I'm in the wrong project. Go back to the other project. Test, close, observations, create, reply. So I have a there it's saying observation type is empty. So there's nothing there. Can you see it? So if I, if I select the observation type and I only take the empties. Oh, too, one, too, too much empty. Now he selected all the empty ones. Um, and I can check them again if they are indeed empty. So yes, you can select it without any problem. And this is a very beautiful example of, of how the camera should not be mounted because you have yes. <laughs> oh, terrible. Who did that? Terrible. Jim? But still, I did it. Um, but still, <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that um, although it's so badly mounted and although the quite often ball in the back um, and it's going back to the question of Graham, um, he recognized all the wild ball running in the back in the night, even far away, even dark even though it was so badly mounted in the field. Um, it was a classical problem where the trees were growing after we mounted the camera. Um, so, but yet the answer is yes, you can very easily select over there the empty ones. So uh, clear, huh, Daniel? Okay, the next question is by uh, Stoyan. Um, and it's, uh, it is developing future protocols for density estimation. Uh, will we need calibration pictures in the same deployment folder in a Guti or just pictures with animals? Uh, you will need them in the same deployment folder and Patrick will explain afterwards. Yeah, so the in, when you run a camera, you first get these calibration photos of, for, the, for the deployment and then, you, and, then, and then after that, of course, the thousands of animals uh, are photographed by you. And then that whole pack, everything will be on the single SD card and that whole card you put in uh, in the same deployment folder in the Gucci, and then uh, what happens afterwards I'll explain later. Okay, and then uh, Lexo asks, I wonder if date time alterations or corrections should be done through a Gucci or R. Uh, so, for example, Jim, if you have a for a by accident you put the wrong time in uh, in uh, in a, in a camera, you programmed the camera wrong, like you. You used AM instead of PM, so you have a twelve-hour mm. difference. What then? Uh, if it's one, um, so go back to the import. So, as I said before, the uh, I will, you still see my screen. Yeah. So the whole the settings of the whole project are done in project settings, saying it's plus one compared to Brussels time, um, which is the time setting of the whole project. And as I explained in um, in a specific deployment, and I can see if I can edit the deployment over here. It will take some time. Show details. Edit the deployment over here. Imagine that this specific deployment has a really wrong time setting. So I was three hours wrong or twelve hours wrong. You can add change this over here. Uh, so I would always change it over there because by this, in the export, you will have the corrected time zone. If you read it in R, you will already have it in the right time zone or the right, the corrected time when you start analyzing. Otherwise, yeah. it becomes a terrible mess. Um, and each time when you make a new export, you will have to realize that there is somewhere, some deployment with the wrong camera setting. So that would be a disaster. So in other words, um, your, in if project. your date time is wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong in the... Uh... In the, uh, the if the time is wrong, it's just a matter of a different time zone. But what if the date is wrong, uh, Jim? I'm afraid it's impossible to solve. You should do it in R. Um, yeah. But but then be really, I mean, what is important to say is that by changing, you still see the screen. Yes. Um, by changing the start and the end, 
you only change the start and the end. <laughs> it's not taking this information throughout the whole um, sequence. So it's not because I would, if, imagine I'm one day wrong and I would change this start of three of August into two of August, it only starts, changes the start day. It will not make all days one day earlier. So, um, so then you really have to make a notice somewhere which is saying by notes, um, the date in this deployment is wrong, but our experience is that those notes, nobody's reading them afterwards if you have a big project with five years or six years and thousands yes. of deployments. So, so um, I would, uh, well, I would do advice, it. throw it away, throw the deployment away. I mean, it's, it's, uh, but it has the only wolf picture in my, in my yeah, study. That, um, that's a pity. Then, it, then you're, then the wolf is irrelevant if it was only one picture in a thousand study yeah, deployments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, then there's a question by Dario. Uh, can you always use a program to change it? You can always use a program to change it before upload. So that means editing the metadata, uh, the exit data uh, before uploading. Mm, that's tricky, but in theory, yeah, that's possible. Yeah. So if you have a problem like this, I would get in touch with the uh, Aguti crew through uh, uh, the email address and ask them how to deal with it. Maybe they can have a solution. Jim and I don't. Then Daniel asked, oh, says if in case the data is wrong, we change the EXIF data before uploading. Okay, Daniel has the same. So Daniel, how is this done? How do you do this? In R. It's very easy. Upload in R, rewrite in R. There is a package called write uh, EXIF, R EXIF, or EXIF R, and you can do it, read EXIF, write EXIF. Um, you can play around, but it's, it's very tricky because you're changing you're changing the basic settings settings of your your files, um, so you can never rebuild them um, afterwards. So I mean we have done it already once, but then be sure that you keep the raw original data uh, somewhere, <laughs> otherwise you you lose information. Okay, good. 